Okay, so now we will move to item number seven, which is a uh, hearing uh, for consideration of these job housing linkage fee and the skilled nursing facilities and rental housing impact fee on new development. And um, I did mention uh, <laughs> earlier during board comments that uh, we will discuss this today, but we will not be taking action. And I did mention uh, that we would like public comments uh, submitted to the county by September 6th. Uh, and with that, uh, welcome uh, Lily Thomas and Brian Crawford. And uh, please go forward, Brian. Yeah, and I'd also like to introduce yeah. to you Debbie LaRue. For those of you, your board members who haven't met Debbie, she's our most recent addition to the housing program. We're very pleased to have her on board. Uh, staff is presenting to you this morning two fees, uh, one of which is an amendment to the county's existing jobs housing linkage ordinance that would set a specific fee for uh, residential care and skilled nursing facilities. The second essentially closes the loop on a development code amendment that the board <coughs> adopted. I believe it was in 2013 <coughs> to establish a, an inclusionary fee for rental housing. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Lily Thomas to give you a brief overview of both those fees before we take your questions. Uh-oh, this seems, I, I seem to have a, be on a bad run again with my PowerPoints. Um, I'm just gonna get started and hopefully it'll come up. Um, so as Brian mentioned, we're here to um, discuss the implementation of two fees. Um, the residential care and skilled nursing facility linkage fee and the rental housing impact fee. Um, both of these, as Brian mentioned, are currently in our development code and um, we, what we're doing is seeking to provide some more clarity on what those fees are. Um, first, before we get to the fees, I thought it would be useful just to briefly talk about the fact that our goals in um, with our inclusionary program is that all types of development contribute in some way to um, affordable housing, either through fees or through units. So when we look at if you're doing a new land division, you would contribute through an inclusionary requirement, either units or fees. If you are developing new commercial space, um, there's a requirement that you pay fees towards the number of new jobs that are produced by that development. Um, if you are building a large single family home, you would also contribute fees. So in the past two years, in 2015 and 2016, the jobs housing linkage fee didn't produce any fees because there wasn't any commercial new commercial development in the county. The inclusionary, um, requirement, there was $92,000 generated in those two years, and the affordable housing impact fee um, produced almost a million dollars. And really what that is telling us is that the most prevalent type of development in the county are those large single family homes. And then looking at what do, what do we do with those fees? Um, in the past two years, we have, your board has contributed funds to the Forest Knolls Trailer Court, so preserving 20 homes as affordable in perpetuity. We have um, also done a preservation with the Piper Court Apartments in Fairfax. 27 um, apartment homes for families were conserved and preserved as in um, affordable housing, again, in perpetuity. And we are in the process of a acquisition of a small apartment building that we will um, acquire and preserve as affordable housing in Stinson Beach. So just to give you a little bit of context before we talk about these specific fees. Um, the first fee um, that we'll be discussing is there, there's kind of two components to it. Um, we'll be charging fees on residential care facilities and skilled nursing facilities. And this is through our jobs housing linkage fee. And currently our code does require a fee. Um, it just doesn't specify what it is. It says in our code, in our development code, it says that developers are to have an analysis done based on and determine how many new employees are, would be, would be uh, needed in that new development type and then we would charge the fee based on that. 
um, you know, what it, what it did is that there was uncertainty. So when developers would come to us and say, what is my fee going to be? What, can you help me estimate what our fee would be? We wouldn't be able to do that. And so what we are seeking to do with this fee is to provide more transparency and clarity so that as uh, people are developing this type of housing, they'll be able to, when they're doing their performa, they'll be able to determine what the fee would be rather than do it at the back end after they were kind of farther along with it. Um, and then what the fee is intended to do is to mitigate some of the need that is developed for affordable housing through the, the lower paid jobs that are produced in that housing or in that employment type. Um, we believe that given our population uh, um, and the aging population in Marin, th that this, they'll likely be more types of this development in our near future. And so again, while we're not trying to discourage this type of development, we do, we are acknowledging that it will um, have a, a significant impact on the additional need for affordable housing for the folks who live in that housing or who, who work in that type of um, facility. Um, <clears throat> so the, the basic rationale <clears throat> as discussed in the uh, Nexus study is that a portion of the new employees who work in any in that given um, type of development will need affordable housing. Some of them will not and some of them will be at the higher incomes um, level and won't require affordable housing but a portion of them will, will need affordable housing. And there is a gap between um, what it costs to develop that housing and what that person could pay. And that is called the affordability gap. And it's used in all of our different fees that we have developed. Um, and you know, this type of housing, residential care and skilled nursing facilities do require a, a pretty significant workforce to serve them. So there's a higher um, ratio, a higher percentage of jobs per square foot than in a number of the other types of development that we have in our commercial um, linkage fee. So it wasn't apples to apples. So we couldn't just say we're going to use one of those other categories. So that's why we decided to have a specific study done that would look at what the impact was of this type of development. And um, these fees would be used in our affordable housing fund to address some of the unmet need um, for affordable housing. Um, the fee that was um, justified through the Nexus study for residential care facilities was $184 a square foot um, and skilled nursing facilities was 217 a square foot. So significantly higher than our other fees which range from um, a few dollars up to um, I think our highest was $15 a square foot. And um, this is really based on the fact that this type of development has a higher per, per employee per square foot ratio. Like it, it takes significant number of folks to serve the, the seniors and the, the disabled folks who would live in these facilities. So because these fees were so much higher than our other fees, we're re we are recommending a significant reduction in the fee to make it more in line with our other fees. Um, that we are, it's almost 10% of what we're, um, of what the proposed, or what the justified fee is that we're recommending. It's about 10%. So $18 a square foot for residential care facilities and $21 a square foot for the skilled nursing facilities. Um, the other fee that we are here to discuss is the rental housing impact fee. And again, our code, as Brian mentioned, um, we adopted this into our development code a number of years ago. Um, in, previous to that um, fee establishment, we would require rental housing to set aside 20% of their units as affordable housing, just like a subdivision or a home ownership project would. However, um, there was a a decision, a court decision that came down called the Palmer decision that said that um, local jurisdictions cannot require um, 
cannot impose an inclusionary requirement on rental housing. And so our only option for ensuring that this type of development contributed to the affordable housing in some way is through a fee. And so that's we are establishing the fee through a nexus study um, that again does the same has the same idea where we look at how many new jobs would be generated by the households who live in that housing. And it's not just the construction of that new rental housing, it's the over time what new jobs would be needed to serve the folks who would live in that housing. And again, the fee is, is intended to address a portion of the unmet affordable housing need for those jobs that would be generated by that type of housing. Um, and the, t the total maximum fee that was justified through this um, Nexus study was $15.75 a square foot. And because um, we acknowledge that smaller homes are more affordable di by design, we are recommending a graduated fee. So the smaller units would pay less per square foot. And then as you go up, the larger um, homes would pay more per square foot. So at 500 and less, it would be $5 a square foot, 500 to 1,000, $10 a square foot, and over 1,000, $15 a square foot. And this is consistent with our affordable housing impact fee, where there's a graduated um, fee based on the size of the home. So in conclusion, um, we are recommending these fees for both for the jobs housing linkage fee for residential care and skilled nursing facilities and the rental housing impact fee. And we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Start with questions and then we'll go to public comment. Uh, Supervisor Sears. Yeah, thank you, Lily, for that presentation. The question I have uh, is in respect to the rental <laughs> housing impact fee for units that are 500 square feet or smaller which strikes me as quite a, that's quite a small unit, which is a good thing. And I, as you noted in, the, in your presentation, the staff report likely to be more affordable. And I'm just wondering if it makes sense to have any fee on that size of unit at all. Uh, and I'm thinking in, of incentives, right? Mm -hmm. We certainly have talked a lot about junior second units, but I, I think there is, can be a good reason to encourage the creation of more smaller size mm -hmm. units in the expectation that they would inherently be more affordable. And perhaps we don't gain that much by p potentially creating a disincentive to create a smaller unit by even having a modest fee on it. So I just appreciate your thoughts about that. Yeah, you know, we we had because it's it's significantly less than the other fees. We felt like that was enough of it. Um, but your board could definitely consider having no fee on something as small as 500 square feet. You know, we haven't seen this type of development, so that's one thing that's that's difficult to kind of, well, you know, what would the impact be to our funding or to other things is that we haven't seen this type there's of development. There's a lot development. of hypotheses. Right, so there's yeah. a lot of hypotheses. The only uh, multifamily rental housing that we've seen other than affordable housing is in the, within the cities and towns, and those have not, we haven't seen any of those units that were as small as this size at all, so. All right, okay, great, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Arnold and then Supervisor Common. Thank you. Um, can we mandate? Can we mandate that um, employees that take the jobs for the new businesses that are built, or that um, people that work in the skilled nursing homes, can we mandate that they will live in in housing that's there? That's what I thought. Well, this the fee. These are fees, right. not. For build, yeah. For building new housing, so you know, it, there's not. It's it's if they were required to develop units on site, there mm -hmm. would be a clear linkage to okay. saying yes, we're going right. to, you know, require right. that mm -hmm. those units be set aside mm -hmm. for those folks. But given that these are fees and it could be development that happened, you know, a number of years down the line, or it could be acquisition of an existing one, mm -hmm. um, I think that there could be some problems with trying to make yeah. that close of a connection okay. with it. Then my second question is, did you discuss at all in doing this report that an increase in rents for seniors in skilled living centers might discourage or might uh, exclude some seniors because of the fees that could live there? Well, we've looked at we looked at the type of development that has been done that has been developed in the past. We mm -hmm. looked at the residential care facilities and the skilled nursing facilities, and you know they haven't been built 
for lower and moderate income folks in the past mm -hmm. without any fees. And it wasn't within the unincorporated county because there hasn't been any right. you know, recently in the right. unincorporated county. But looking within the cities and towns, mm -hmm. currently there aren't units that are set aside that are affordable to those categories mm -hmm. of seniors anyway, even without the fee. So I can't see that there was a connection that the okay. fee would be the, the tipping. Um, you know, and when we looked at our surround at our other communities within Marin, at the cities and towns, there aren't um, there aren't there aren't other fees like this for within the cities and towns to compare it with. But like the inclusionary fee, where the county and the impact fee, the county is usually the one who adopts these type of fees mm -hmm. first. You know, mm -hmm. we were one of the first communities to adopt the inclusionary fee in 1980 across the state. Now, mm -hmm. you know, most many communities mm -hmm. have inclusionary. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the affordable housing impact fee. That we there was only two other communities that had that on the books when mm -hmm. we adopted it. Now there's a lot of jurisdictions that contact mm -hmm. us frequently saying we'd like to replicate it. Can we can we look at the materials that you use? So, so Leslie, can you uh, what how what is a skilled nursing facility say as opposed to a nursing home or but what is a skilled? It, uh, I mean, is there give us the no, name of the definition? Someone. No, give us the name of some of one that's existing. Of some of the existing ones? Yeah. You, you want to read those off? So now we have Aegis in Puerto Madera. Okay. So what's that? A skilled nursing or a residential care? It's both. It's, it's both. both. It's it's both. both. Okay. okay. Yeah, some of these are have a continuum of care, which is right. In okay. To, um, and you might actually have the same for them. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm new to the county, so I'm not familiar with all these facilities. Um, but then like in San Anselmo, the, for the residential care facility, there's Bello Assisted Living. Mm -hmm. And then the Redwoods is an example of, a, of one that has a continuum, continuum, right? There's independent living and then there's a residential care facility. There's not a skilled nursing facility yeah. at Redwoods, but that's so another example. And then example. Kenfield Rehab would be a, just a skilled. That's a skilled nursing only, facility. Yes. Not yes. There's one on Smith Ranch Road. I Smith Ranch Road is a has a residential care facility and a independent living, right? Wow. Okay. Great. Thank so. you. That's good. Thank you. Supervisor Conley. Thank you. I'm uh, trying to get a better sense of the overall landscape on inclusionary zoning right now. You mentioned the. Palmer decision. I know there's been some additional uh, legal activity around the issue. Um, my understanding is for multifamily residential in the county, we have a 20% uh, target for inclusionary. No, it, multifamily rental housing, we cannot require units. So what the Palmer decision did is they applied the Costa Hawkins rent control laws that says you, um, a, a, la a landlord or a property owner ha gets to establish their rents on their own without any oversight on new development. And so they used that law and applied it to the inclusionary requirement and said you cannot require, local jurisdictions cannot require a percentage of those units to be set aside with lower rents um, so if a new multifamily housing development, a rental housing project came through that was a market rate, we would uh, currently would just have a fee. There's no, there's no requirement. We can't have units. And is that, that. The, is, is that the current state of the law? That is the current state of the law. There was two, um, uh, two years ago, the legislator passed um, an amendment to that that would overrule that. The governor vetoed it. Um, there's a bill again that's being proposed to undo that and you know who knows what will happen with that. The other question is um, what's noteworthy here is it it sounds like residential care facilities um, and skilled nursing facilities are both zoned commercial. Um, interestingly though what we're really talking about are residences so I'm wondering does that how that factors in in terms of, and again, I guess you answered the question overall. I'd be curious, can we come in and, and in some way say, hey, why don't you set aside some units for actual affordability? Mm -hmm. um, 
what I'm hearing you say, though, is the option is exclusively a fee. But maybe if you can talk about commercial versus residential. Right. Um, this is a commercial use. So under our code, it's considered a commercial use. That's why we have the, the linkage fee that we're proposing is under our jobs housing um, commercial linkage fees. Um, you know, given that most of these would be classified, you know, even if it wasn't, if we if we classified them as a residential use, they would still be, <clears throat> excuse me, they'd still look like a like a rental housing, and we would be only be able to charge a fee anyway. So, you know, I don't think that there's a way of requiring units. A developer could, of course, say, I'd rather provide units than um, pay the fee. That uh, there's an option for that. Um, but usually, the difficulty in this, even prior to the Palmer decision, was that because of the services are really the ongoing cost. So even if they provided the rental unit, it's the services that are associated with it are so expensive um, that that's really the prohibitive thing of including some of the units as affordable. Although there are some examples, Corte Madera um, has a, a senior care facility that um, they required just through a development agreement with the city um, some of their units to be set aside as affordable. So there are examples there are of examples agreements of yes. or, or incentivizing that. I, yes. I think that is something uh, to, to explore further. Um, but thank you. This clarifies. I, I think uh, we have heard from the community there are some folks who want to weigh in more on this particular proposal. So I, I uh, agree with our decision, I think, to allow that to occur as well. And we'll come back to this. Thank you. Supervisor Rice. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lizzie. I also um, had a question on the rental, in the, the fee for the smaller units and whether that would end up being a, um, a disincentive or at least a, um, we want to incentivize affordability and size does translate to affordability. Um, I also wanted to know, so with regards to second units or junior second units, would would this apply? No, this wouldn't apply to junior second units or second units. Okay. And then um, <coughs> on the, on the um, skilled nursing facility and the residential care, um, I'm, we, I, it's my experience that we've actually got, we, we have the demand and the beds that are available, particularly for skilled nursing facilities locally, is um, w there's high demand. Uh, those beds are filled. Kentfield Rehab, I believe, has done a remo some remodeling in, in past years that maybe expanded their number of beds and or services, but I know it's, um, my guess is the community needs more per population. Uh, we have, there's probably some sort of population ratio, you know, skilled nursing beds per population, right. and I'm sure we're not there. That said, and the, the whole, um, the report, your staff report says that it premises on an anticipation of develop an anticipation of development of more skilled nursing and residential care. And I'm just, what's the basis for that, and where do you think it might happen? Because I, um, anyway, could you, could you answer that, please? So it, it's based on you know when we look at the chart of what our population is and our aging population, that the that demand it will be in response to the demand as the demand is increasing that we will expect there will be more proposals of this type. You know, within the past year, there's been three proposals just at very early f stages that have been contemplated that were either a residential care or a skilled nursing facility or a combination of those three. So, you know, that's significant given our, our limited number of, of projects. Okay. And then... Also, uh, Supervisor Rice, the State Economic Development Department um, lists fastest gr uh, growing jobs in for the state as well as the Marin, and I believe that personal <coughs> care aides, which are the types of employees that would be working at these types of facilities, is one of the fastest growing jobs uh, for Marin. It's projected to grow by almost 47 percent between 2012 and 2022. Um, that data also indicates that the, the median wage, hourly wage for those workers is quite low. Yeah, and that is, is very uh, seems pretty obvious. So here's my other question. Um, one, I, I'm just globally, how well do do inclusionary policies and these kinds of fees work, and how how well do they actually translate into affordable creation of workforce housing? And you talked a little bit about that, but I think there's probably 
um, a debate going on out there about how effective these kinds of mechanisms and tools are, and I think it's good for us to understand. And, um, and then secondly, I mean, we've had, we may not have had a lot of development, but we've had significant job growth in this county. Um, <coughs> and so we don't really have any policy, uh, any policies or tools that um, recognize the job growth that's mm -hmm. generated e commercially or through, you know, residential um, that, that happens within the existing built environment, correct? So it's not really a jobs, it's not a jobs, um, it's not a jobs housing linkage fee, it's, it's actually a development, this is a development fee, yet most of the jobs that are generated in this county aren't associated with any development would be my assumption my, when you look at the numbers of job growth. No comment? Uh, I'm not sure if that's correct or not. Um, anyway, I seen but we don't, have, we don't have anything that addresses job growth and housing generally unless it's associated with development. That's correct. And uh, I think as Lily mentioned at the beginning of her presentation, the, these ordinances are based upon the assumption, if not the reality, that when new development does occur, commercial development, that generates uh, new jobs. Some of those jobs are low wage jobs. And I think that's particularly mm -hmm. true with respect to skilled nursing facilities. And that creates a need for households and there's an affordability gap that should be addressed in some fashion. And I'm so not, ar I'm not arguing with that at yeah. all. I'm just saying that we're missing, I mean, economic growth is great and job growth is great, but um, we're not, we're not, meet, we're not, this doesn't address the entire problem at all. And I'm not sure we have any tool in the toolbox that does, um, does address it. Yeah, yeah, and certainly we're not attempting to address that uh, today. So yeah. yeah, okay. Hey, well, if I could jump in here, I mean, I, as I read this, it's aimed indirectly to try to address that problem by putting, getting more <coughs> money to put into an affordable housing trust fund that then could be spent on the acquisition of affordable properties. So yeah. it's not as if there's no linkage, but, but there's no one solution in this study. Mm -hmm. Correct. And, you know, I, I do yeah. want to remind the board that um, we see these, these fees uh, as being um, relevant to the board's recent pivot in terms of our broader affordable housing policies to move towards acquisitions, preservation, conversions, and these are the type of fees that can help uh, move the dial incrementally, albeit, right. but um, nonetheless, that we can make progress and with I am, these And I am totally tools. on board there. And there's one thing that I don't know that you mentioned, Lily, in your um, presentation that the dollars that we collect help leverage other dollars towards projects eventually. It's not the sole solution in tw terms of a funding source. So uh, I'm on board with the concept. I just wanted to sort of look at the larger landscape as well. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I did want to also reinforce the idea that we asked you to help us come up with a strategy for acquisition, and this is one of the tools. I think what we're seeing is it's a limited tool. It's an awkward tool in some respects. Uh, in my view. Um, and that's partly because um, if we think of the larger situation that we're in, we have been the slowest growing county in the Bay Area for 20 years. We're going to be the slowest growing county. So growth uh, is not a generator of significant new development. Without new development, these fees are going to be extremely <coughs> limited. In addition to that, I think what's really going on is this ever-increasing wealth gap in our country is creating a more, more and more difficult situation. Um, and so we're using what I consider to be a kind of an awkward tool, uh, which is a have and have not kind of approach. Uh, having been through uh, construction of a small home for my parents over the last year, I can see that the, the number of fees that are being attached to projects are burying us, okay? Because this is one more smaller fee, but there are fees for water, there are fees for every utility, there are significant fees for sewage uh, or septic. And so what you have is a project at the other end that isn't even affordable to most people um, while we're trying to get a small amount to take care of a um, of, of fairly um, lower income goal that we have. And uh, this isn't a criticism, but it's a recognition that it's a very limited effectiveness um, and what I really think we need uh, is, um, and you know, future boards could look at this, is that the housing transfer fee, which has made a couple of legislative attempts statewide where everyone contributes at the time of the transfer, so you lift all boats. If someone's getting 18% appreciation or 10 or 7, 
uh, on their home and they sell their home after some period of time. A small increment of that shared across the entire community is a much better strategy than to try and just pour all of our need into new development. It'll either scare it away or make it so unaffordable for the broader range of our community. So, you know, we're, we're trying to deal with this. Um, I think this, you know, we'll fine tune it. But what I also think is that what's missing here is that, it, you know, there needs to be a coordinated strategy for affordability. And we can't get at affordability in rental housing by inclusionary, but we're going to have to come up with incentive programs and we're going to have to work with water districts and sewage agencies and others that say, if we can get some agreement for a, a, a deed restriction or a, a limited term or even a permanent affordability, what can we do to incentivize people to make that choice? So this is just a small piece of that overall goal of a diverse housing supply. Um, and I think that the amount of money that we charge um, is really going to be important to understand, which is why you took the time for this study. And we'll hear from the public and some of the folks who would be most impacted about it by it uh, as to whether we got the number right. But this is a number that can be adjusted uh, on some basis, right, isn't it, Lily, that uh, an annual review of, of our uh, fee structure would be legitimate? Um, yes, I wouldn't recommend that we do it on an annual basis because it's fairly resource intensive. Um, what we do is that, you know, you set the fee. The fee that we're recommending is 10% of what is, was justified by, by the study. So that's a significant discount. So even, you know, and, and the study was done conservatively, assuming with conservative assumptions in a number of ways. So I think that in um, general, this, the justified fee is probably less than it could have been because it was conservative assumptions. And then the 10% of it is also a significant discount. But we would recommend that it be tied to a, an index like our other fees so that it doesn't have to be updated. But, you know, if in the future your board wanted to look at reducing the fee or having a study done again, then absolutely that could be done. Can I have a follow-up on that? Point? So, and I can't find it in here, but I thought I remember seeing, so the other categories um, that are specified um, are much lower, I believe, than this is going to be because they're, uh, and they have been indexed over time, and yet they're very, aren't they significant? They were, they were not indexed. So that was done before prior to my being here and that that's that when that fee was adopted it wasn't it wasn't indexed so subsequently we've indexed all of our fees so that they go up a little bit every year they follow the the uh, they're tied to a, a cost of living increase um, but that was not so you know if there was significant commercial development I would think like it's time for us to bite the bullet and pay for another fee to update those but since we haven't had new commercial development we haven't decided to put resources into updating that fee but yes eventually that fee needs to be updated and when it is we'll tie it to a to a um, an index like the other fees okay thanks Thank you. okay I'd like to open it up for public comment Raleigh Katz, Marin Association of Public Employees. I just want to first um, commend you and your staff for your continued efforts to try to find ways to deal with this very challenging problem of affordable housing and understanding that making good public policy is difficult. Uh, a few observations. Uh, I'm old enough to remember what had happened in this state before Prop 13 passed, and my memory is that we didn't have as many fees in those days because we paid for all these costs broadly with a broader property tax and then after Prop 13 passed we had to revert to fees which does as Supervisor Kinsey points out affects the cost of building things um, and ironically I've heard over the years um, so-called they call themselves taxpayer advocates I call them anti-tax and anti-government folks advocating for fees and not broader taxes the second observation I would make is this discussion you had about the growth in jobs of people caring for older people, low-wage low jobs. Uh, my antidotal experience, having had both my parents at the end of their lives spend some time in skilled nursing and, all, and actually the end of their lives in a residential facility, and walking picket lines in San Rafael and other places, skilled nursing homes, is that the majority of the folks doing this work are women. 
The majority of these folks are women who are not of European ancestry. And I just have this image of more and more people in Marin who are affluent, spending the end of their lives in residential facilities, being cared for by women who are not affluent, who are not of European ancestry, having really long commutes to get to work every day because they can't afford to live here. So if we have a way to try to change that, we're all for it. Good morning. Good morning. President Kinsey, members of the board, my name is Neil Sorensen. I'm an attorney. I represent Venture Corporation and Robert Eaves, um, who is planning a, an assisted living, independent living project in, in North San Rafael. Um, and while I'm on that subject, I think you need to be very careful with your terms. I mean, there's, there's memory care, there's assisted living, there's independent living, there's skilled nursing facilities. Um, and it would, it would behoove you and I think the public for you to be very precise. We're pleased that you're planning on continuing this for additional time because we think that uh, there wasn't enough time to review the study. And I think that, uh, at least from my client's perspective, besides the fact that we want time to review it, I think we will be able to give you some uh, important data that will help in making the study better. If you had a chance to review the study, and, and, and I just got it yesterday, so it was difficult, but buried somewhere, I think on page 19 in the in the uh, study on residential care and skilled nursing facilities, the study pretty much <coughs> states that it's a groundbreaking study. Uh, the, the authors couldn't find anything like it in California. So I think what they've done is come up with some solutions or attempted solutions to come up with their numbers that don't really reflect reality. Uh, for example, the employment numbers that the, the study author used, as we believe, are probably double what a typical assisted living or independent living facility would utilize. And that, in effect, skews the fee. Uh, now, I understand you are discounting the fee, but I think you should have the real number before you, before you come up with the discounted fee. And, and I'm pleased that you want comments submitted in advance, because what we'd rather do, at least on my client's behalf, is submit information or even meet with your staff and try and work out some kind of collaborative solution rather than hashing this out in front of you at your next hearing. Um, the problem we're going to have if we have to submit by September 6th is uh, Mr. Eves gets on a plane today for a two-week vacation. He's, uh, he's promised to work on his vacation on this and read the studies. Uh, and we will attempt to get you the comments by September 6th. If we go a little bit beyond that, I hope you'll understand uh, why we did that. Um, what I'm actually hoping to do is get the comments to staff and then perhaps meet with them or have a discussion with them about some of these issues before your next meeting. So we would, again, ask and appreciate the fact that you are going to continue it. If you have any questions, I'm happy to, to attempt to answer them, although I'm not an expert on these types of facilities. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Neil. All right. So we'll bring it back then. Um, staff, any additional comments uh, um, in terms of the way the process might work. Um, it has been mentioned that not just uh, this particular uh, applicant or potential applicant, but others, uh, including environmental housing advocates, uh, have asked for some time. So I think that it is important for folks who want to get engaged in this to submit comments, to share their thoughts. And then um, I think we'll leave it to the staff to determine the best way to process that and bring that back to us in, in either a revised staff report or a, a, an explanation of what the comments were. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Uh, Supervisor? Yeah, just um, I did have a question, I, and it, a uh, gentleman reminded me of it. Is there, um, we're going on a, we're using the square foot, um, the, the footprint as the um, measuring, the variable that um, goes into the equation, the formula. And I'm wondering for the skilled nursing and the residential care, um, is is there a code that demands a certain amount of square feet per bed per patient um, as because or or is it like uh, in hospitals you have to have a certain right. number of square feet they they looked at I don't know the answer to that whether there's a specific code that's under the state licensing requirements but I do know that the 
Nexus study looked at existing facilities. So if that's the case, then that would have been factored in because they looked at the square footage that was or that was used within existing facilities in each of those categories. So what percentage of the existing facility was used for, um, you know, for bed, for, you know, residential <laughs> piece as opposed to, you know, dining, et cetera. Right, and so I guess what I was wondering, the question I had in my head is why wouldn't the formula be based on capacity, client capacity, because actually the employee ratio is more associated with how many people are in the facility than how big or small the facility is, whether that's the dining room or the, or the, um, you know, the residential space. We'll look into that. Thanks. Supervisor Sears. So I just, just a comment. I think it's good that we're taking a little bit more time, so um, we have we can think about it a bit more, and, and various folks in the community can weigh in. But I, I do want to say, despite our questions and comments, I think it's really good to be looking um, at these issues and to be looking forward, particularly on our residential care and skilled nursing facilities and, and perhaps names of other kinds of facilities that we want to include in that broad category as well. Um, given our demographics, I think this is very timely to be considering it. Um, and I also think it's good to be looking at the, the rental piece of it. So I, I really want to applaud the effort, um, but I, I am glad that we're having just a little bit more Thanks.